and getting asking them what they really want. And I'd imagine that in in your line of work in the digital space, especially that you're quite that's quite unique because there would be so many other people who are selling it fast and hard, mm-hmm. and it's just it's, it's the lights and everyone you get sort of oh blinded by all, it all, but don't get hurt and don't get to see. Mm-hmm. So you're slowing it completely down. Has that has that been a real benefit to to that to that consulting practice that you've found that you've been able to maintain clients and pick up new clients because of the authenticity? Yeah, we get we haven't marketed ourselves at all. We've gotten nothing but referrals, and and we have yeah, okay. yeah we we have a very high close rate. We close you know seventy eighty percent of the people that come towards us. So um, yeah, and we grow and people see the value in. Like we're not just technicians; we're looking at the big picture because we want. We kind of look at ourselves as a partner rather than just a contractor. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And I want to touch a bit on on the the meditation cushions and Conrad yeah. Men's in general because that's sort of what caught my eye because it was the, the quality of cushion mm-hmm. that you sort of again I, you know there's so many meditation cushions out there but there's not as many that look as stylish mm-hmm. and of a good quality and I would love to work out how did you get to to that space to go actually i want to put a twist or a theme on something that's already done and do it of of, of this nature and i know that they're handmade in in america as well Mm -hmm. so can you just overview that a little bit yeah so you know i started with bags but the whole idea of the brand was tools for the man on the journey to find himself and yeah so i originally was going to say the spiritual adventure but i don't i didn't think the world was quite ready for it about three years ago um so I, I started with the gentleman explore, but also having that in the back of my mind. And if you read that, the about on the Conrad website, it, it talks about yeah. the the adventures uh, and looking for a, to define themselves or experience the world. And then the spiritual people um, and the hippies taking drugs or meditating or whatever it was. Now with technology of where we're we're looking towards like all these innovations and this in, this information overflow where, you know, everybody has all the information in the world on their phone and in their fingertips. And so Conrad came out of just that, like I wanted to make stuff that I liked and tools, you know, um, like a meditation cushion is a, is a tool. And if it's beautiful and, it, and you love it, you're going to want to sit on it more, which means you're more likely to meditate, yeah. which is, means you're more likely to have some sort of awake experience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, so how do you, in your in your work, like I feel, and this is where I really wanted to get to. Like I feel like your two, basically your two worlds are very different. Like you've got meditation cushions and this stillness, and then you've got this this digital mm-hmm. world. Is this did you did you manifest it to sort of have that like a seesaw balance type <laughs> concept where you wanted to live in both both worlds, or did it just naturally grow that way? Well, it, so my first company was the site called Seek Retreat S E E K. And that was a website where you could book yoga retreats online, kind of like Travelocity or something like that. And so within that, so I'd gone to Naropa University in Boulder, which is like this Buddhist university started by Chungam Trumpa Rinpoche. And um, so I knew a lot of like the yoga and the meditation and the the hippie people. And when I wanted to build that website, I had to learn all the technology. So I learned the digital aspect as a, you know, tactics on how to spread yoga. So yoga retreats, meditation retreats. And from there, you know, most of my friends have become all like these famous yoga and meditation people. And they're in need of services, you know. They need the yeah. tactics to get their their teachings or their products out there, you know. We're redoing the website for this Kundalini studio in town. We work with the Moon Deck, which is like an Oracle tarot card deck doing their digital stuff. So yeah. we're really doing the digital side of a lot of health and wellness and, and spiritual companies. Yeah. Cool. Okay. So that, that sort of closes yeah. the gap. And your your spiritual path, like your path from climbing and you're in Denver, mm-hmm. it sounded like, you know, Trungpa Rinpoche and that and that that Buddhist mm-hmm. side of things. Like can you can you dig into that a little bit more of, of how you discovered that path? Did that sort of then almost replaced the climbing to a certain extent or was it was it different yeah so it was the parting for sure like I, but that was like taking acid and and mushrooms and like really having like vivid life-changing experiences and yeah and okay, then yeah. eventually like I, I got sober maybe seven yeah. years ago and 
um, once I, I, took, I did a liver and gallbladder cleanse that I got from this um, Chinese medicine guy, and the, the craving for alcohol was lifted, and then all of a sudden I was very aware of the world, which was very overwhelming and painful. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I know, I know yeah. what that's like. Then you got this awareness, like the yeah, matrix. it's like totally stepping out of the matrix, and and like he, being able to hear music for the first time. And so my, my dad was a hippie, so we were doing breath work and like sucking in our stomachs uh, when I was like seven years old. So I'd been exposed to it, and and even during my climbing years, my dad always had like a bunch of Michael Murphy books, including uh, the Psychic Side of Sports, about visualization, yeah, yeah. and. Yeah, 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 and I'd taken uh, Frank Luliner's meditation at Naropa, so I've been exposed to it. And so, right around that time, I did like a weekend, like a three-day weekend with the Shambhala Center here in Los Angeles, and that was like a yeah. really hard reset. That was like taking acid, but not taking acid. Yeah, okay. where like <laughs> something happened, like that was a reboot in my brain. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Because um, I, I know what I've read, I know I don't know it firsthand, but I know that Trungpa Rinpoche, you know, actually was an alcoholic or drunk a lot himself oh, yeah. while he was teaching. Yeah, and what it was, one, so that sort of, he was sort of almost the bad boy of, of sort of meditation back mm-hmm. in those days because everyone was very, very, you know, level mm-hmm. and and just did it by the book. And he was the the outcast. A yeah, bit. well, all those guys back then, um, Yogi Bhajan, Trungpa Trungpa Osho, like all these guys. Um, like many w- which were wealthy, like what's wrong with being being abundant, having wealth, and being spiritual? Yeah. And um, yeah. but then also like you, you know, trying to drinking and and womanizing and all of these other things. Like, does that mean he's not spiritual? But is he spiritual? But then he also does well, these yeah. things, right? And, yeah. and then do you have to act spiritual to be spiritual? Right. You can be. You can be pious. Yeah. You can be. Um, you know, kind and loving. And, um, and I think he did that. And, you know, Krishna Marty does talks about that as well as like thinking about the things that you've been programmed to think are right or wrong. And like, this is okay. Yeah. It's okay. Like, um, if you're a, a priest, you shouldn't have a wife and you shouldn't, and you should, you should be kind. And you, um, uh, or, or if you're a monk, you should, um, you should wear robes and you shouldn't wear a suit and tie. Um, or yeah. if you're you're a spiritual in some way, you shouldn't have money. You should be you should be poor. Same thing with an artist. So all these things don't mean that you can't be spiritual. That you can't have an awakening. You, you can't help other people. That you can't think about karma and life cycles or what you're going to do with this life. Um, yeah. Or have or have just conscious awareness. So I think all those guys were really good about almost using their bad behavior to illustrate certain points around that. I agree. And I, 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 when I first read that stuff, like, you know, eight, nine years ago, now I actually found it really refreshing because it's like, everyone's going to stuff up. Everyone's going to make mistakes and everyone can live their version of this. It's not, it's not about it having to be in a certain bubble and it has to be a certain way because the idea is that everyone's got freedom of thought. And then also that, who are you to judge? Because the whole concept is not non-judgment, and then if you're judging, you're judging. So I always, it always fascinated me. So it was interesting to talk because it's especially in Australia, there's not as many people to talk to about a guy like Rinpoche or a you know, Yoga Bhajan or, or Krishnamurti because it's sort of really in its early stages here in sort of that that context. So that was really interesting. Alex, what's like your spiritual journey now and where you're at? Like, wh- wh- where's that? Are you still a regular meditator and, and mm-hmm. you know, looking after yourself in, in that space? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wake up super early. I do, uh, sometimes I'll do like a full Kundalini set, usually with some breath work and then yeah. uh, like a meditation at the end. And then I go lift weights. Um, I feel that yeah. doing a lot of like Kundalini and meditation puts me out to outer space a lot and lifting, lifting weights. Or, or climbing or having some sort of spiritual practice or physical practice really grounds me and balances out those two energies. Yeah, okay. And I, I feel more grounded when I'm a little bit heavier, when I'm a little bit bulkier. Yeah, okay, nice, yeah. nice. Um, and the Kundalini, do you do it, do you, like, is that, do you do a full set? Is that you by yourself or do you go to a studio and, and do that? Because it's really, again, in Australia, not many people would 
know it. There's not a sort of common thing. I know that in LA it's getting becoming more popular. Yeah, yeah, it's huge. I, I did my teacher training last year. Um, yeah, oh, nice. and I was teaching for a little bit, but running two companies, I got a little too busy for that. But um, yeah, I did. Uh, I usually go to Rama in Venice. Um, I love yeah. those guys. Uh, Guru Jagat's a really good friend. Um, and I go to Nine Treasures in West Hollywood. Yeah, it's uh, it's my for sure. It was kind of like okay, like nice. with climbing. Like uh, once I did it, like I knew that that's what that's what that was my practice for sure. Yeah, yeah beautiful. I haven't got in. I've I've just been researching it actually quite a bit because I've done a little bit of just regular yoga hatha mm-hmm. and, and yeah, um, vinyasa and stuff. But I do with the the mindfulness and the insight stuff that I've really got into. I feel that it, it it's potentially a, a more aligned fit to sort of to that that stuff that I really love in a meditation sense that it might be a better fit mm-hmm. for me. Um, so that it was just interesting. That's a personal question of just asking, you yeah, know, how, how you discovered it and, and how it does take you back out there. And then the weights do ground your back. Cause I, I find exactly the same thing. I love to do the weights or I love to go for a run to sort of get back. Yeah. Yeah. yeah to be here in like the body because we're, yeah. And, that, yeah. and that's a big thing that I have. I do have a problem with that. I'm judging on that when people are, like they live in that realm all the time when they're like yeah. either hooked on uh, meditation or they're ho- hooked on ayahuasca or whatever they're doing, they're doing it all the time. And it's almost another yeah. form of escape and they're not putting it in yeah, practice. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think some people, you know, even the, you know, that that's the only way to like, you can't sort of like, you know, that the weights or to do something else is not the right practice. It's almost like a, it's a preachy type feel Whereas it's that open exploration of what feels mm-hmm. good, and that might change over the years. It might not be weights. It might be, you know, running, or it might be something different as you get older. But that's okay. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's whatever suits. Do your kids meditate? Oh, uh, our kids, yeah, Do they meditate? yeah, 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 yeah. So our twelve-year-old, he does it pretty much every night to help him with sleep, and it's really helped him to be honest. Like it's it's amazing that the nights where he can't sleep are usually the nights that he hasn't mm-hmm. done it, and he'll come back out and do like a 10 minute sit with me and he'll do a body scan just in bed by himself so I've taught him like just a just a really simple body scan to connect mm-hmm. back um and the the my other two girls do the two little ones not so they've just turned five and two so they're sort of they sit and then they just run off and it's cool like that's yeah. fine but them seeing the other three sit they said it's a bit like I, I wanted to ask the next question about you growing up and your dad's doing breath work like how instrumental is that to your growing up that your dad's sort of that hippie and he's doing breath work at that age and and I'm really mindful that you know especially being a parent of how important my meditation and my mindfulness practices and and how I live influences my kids and and what they believe to be important and and purposeful and and what we value Mm -hmm. yeah so I think it's you know and how was that for you yeah sometimes I wanted my dad to just be like normal guy that like watch sports and go fishing and and all that <laughs> <laughs> and um and i you know i got that from my uncles but i i did have something very special in him having that and i you know he had some experiences on drugs back in the 60s where he really talks about having like this christ conscious kind of awakening of where i mean, kind of realizing that everybody could be divine in some way and um mm. and so but then sitting with him and doing that almost made it like normal for me to do that you know when yeah, I, yeah. I eventually came to it of where it did feel kind of natural then I, I should have been doing this all along um, and I think in this day you know back this was like you know early 80s when he was doing that with me and so yeah. it was really weird back then like especially in rural Minnesota like it's like yeah I can um, imagine yeah. I can imagine and so for um uh, and I'm assuming your kids now and like people all over the world are meditating. Oprah's meditating, you know, like everybody's meditating. Yeah. So it's, it's cool that it's accepted. Yeah. And I, the stuff that you're like with your cushions and even sort of how you market meditation, especially to men, like I think meditation, I don't know what it's like. You're probably in a, a little bit of a, a bubble in Venice because it's so popular, but you know, the Australian man, what I see generally is not a meditator and it's sort of seen as that sort of fluffy, nice to spiritual hippie type thing. But, you know, your feeds and, and, and your cushions, 
is trying to it's almost making it cool like it's, it looks really appealing it makes things like 